Hello, my name is Louis Marcos, and I'm a professor in English at Houston Baptist University. And this year, in our freshman year seminar, all of our freshmen will be reading Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And so I'm going to be giving a little introduction to Lewis and Mere Christianity uh, to get you excited to read this book and to be prepared to wrestle with the ideas that you'll be encountering in Mere Christianity. Now, C.S. Lewis, that's Clive Staples Lewis, though all of his friends called him Jack Lewis, is considered by most people to be the greatest apologist of the 20th century. Now, what is an apologist or a Christian apologist? Well, a Christian apologist is not somebody who says, I'm sorry about the Crusades, I'm sorry about this, I'm sorry about that. That is not what we mean by a Christian apologist. We're using the word apologetics in its older Greek meaning. Uh, Socrates gave a famous apology or defense before the court of Athens. And he actually lost and got killed, but anyway. An apology is a defense. Now, a lot of people don't realize it, but Christian apologists are getting that word, not from Socrates, but from the Bible. First Peter chapter 3, Peter says to Christians, be always ready to give an account of the hope that is within you, but with all gentleness and humility. Now, when it says, always be ready to give an account, in Greek, that word is apologia. A Christian apologist is somebody who offers a logical defense of the Christian faith. Now, that doesn't mean that a Christian apologist thinks that you can reason yourself into the kingdom of God. A Christian apologist understands that ultimately is faith and grace. But a Christian apologist wants to make the point in our modern world that Christianity is not irrational. Christianity makes sense. It can be explained in logical, rational terms. Yes, it takes a step of faith to embrace the grace of Christ. But Christianity itself makes sense. Ever since the Enlightenment, about 250 years ago, our modern Western world has separated reason and faith in two airtight compartments. And many Christians for the last 200 years have sort of passively said, well, Christianity is just about faith and feelings and emotions, but it's not rational. We can't study it. It's just what I feel about God. Well, that's a very modern notion. It's only about 250 years old. Christianity is a worldview. It makes sense. It can be explained. A Christian apologist, maybe the best way to put it, is someone who believes that Christianity is a step of faith, but it doesn't have to be a leap of faith. Many of you may have heard the phrase leap of faith. It means you come to a point in your life, nothing makes sense, but you jump into the void and hope that God will catch you. Well, again, a Christian apologist understands that it's faith, but it's a step of faith. It makes sense, it appeals to our mind, but then we've got to open our heart and receive it. So Christian apologetics is not only about reason, but it is trying to assert that the Christian faith and Christian doctrine makes sense and that rational, highly educated people can believe in things like the Trinity and the Incarnation and the Resurrection and the Virgin Birth. That you don't have to take your brain and put it on the side in order to be a Christian. In case you're wondering, other Christian apologists of the 20th century would include earlier G.K. Chesterton, Dorothy Sayers and Francis Schaeffer. A little more recently, we have Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel, um, uh, Ravi Zacharias, I don't know if some of these names, J.P. Moreland. There's lots of people, William Lane Craig, who are following in the tradition of Lewis. But C.S. Lewis is really, in some way, the father of them all. He does it so well. He gives us a wonderful, logical defense that shows us that Christianity is a reasonable religion. Now, C.S. Lewis was particularly apt to be one of the great 
Christian apologist of the 20th century because he spent the first half of his life as an atheist. Now, Lewis did grow up in an Anglican home. He was baptized, and, and so many people would say it's probably more of a return to faith. I mean, he grew up in a Christian home. But early on, especially after his mother died when Lewis was only about 10, Lewis slowly abandoned any faith in Christianity and ultimately abandoned God. And throughout most of his teenage years, throughout his 20s, up until the age of 32, Lewis was an atheist. But God was keeping an eye on him. One of my favorite stories about Lewis is that Lewis spent many years at those terrible British boarding schools. You always hear terrible stories about and he begged his father to get him out of those schools. And so finally, when Lewis was about 16 years old, his father took him out of the boarding school and sent him to a private tutor in Surrey, England. Now, the tutor's name was Kirkpatrick, and Kirkpatrick had been Lewis's father's tutor when he was a boy. So he was a much older man. Lewis had heard stories about him all of his life, and he was a little bit nervous to meet this man that his father considered the greatest tutor of all time. Now, Lewis was a bookish kind of person. Lewis was somebody who hated small talk. But he thought all parents and adults did was small talk. And so he felt like, well, if I'm going to impress Kirkpatrick, I guess I'm going to have to be like an adult at a cocktail party and engage in some small talk. And so when he first met Kirkpatrick, Lewis tells us in his autobiography, he walked up and shook his hand. He looked him in the eye, and he said, Sir, Surrey is less wild than I had expected it to be. Now, Lewis just meant this as small talk, like listening to everybody's uh, health and the weather, like my fair lady, if you've ever seen that. And Lewis expected that when he made that innocuous comment about Surrey being less wild, that Kirkpatrick would answer back with some discussion of cricket or something else that was innocuous. What Lewis didn't know was that Kirkpatrick hated small talk even more than young C.S. Lewis. And so when Lewis said, Surrey is a less wild than I thought it would be, Kirkpatrick shot back at him and said, on what did you base your assumption that Surrey would be wild? How do you define the word wild? What is your criteria for wildness? Did you consult any almanacs before you came? And he questioned Lewis and questioned him until Lewis realized Not only did he not know what the word wild meant, he had no idea what he was talking about. Now, most people, whether they were 16 or 35, if they had that meeting, they would probably shut up and never speak again for the next two years of tutoring. But Lewis says in his British vernacular that it was red beef and strong beer to him. And for the next two years, he allowed Kirkpatrick to train his mind in the most logical, systematic way. Lewis learned how to uncover the assumptions of any statement that could be made, to follow through logic, deduction and induction, and to train his mind. Now, at the time, not only was Lewis an atheist, but Kirkpatrick was an atheist as well. But here's the wonderful thing. When, 16 years later, Lewis became a believing Christian, he did not throw out everything that Kirkpatrick had taught him. What he did is took the same logical, deductive, and inductive thinking and all of the stuff that he was taught, how to chase assumptions and all of that, he took it and he applied it to to the defense of the gospel and Christianity. You see, When Lewis wrote his apologetics, he said himself, he wanted to write books that he wished he could have read when he was an atheist. Lewis insisted that if he was going to write Christian apologetics, he would not preach to the choir. He would try to speak in terms that atheists could understand. And not just atheists, but agnostics and other people that are not Christian, other religions, people that believe in God but not in Jesus. Now, I mention that because when you read mere Christianity, if you're a Christian particularly, you may be surprised how rarely Lewis quotes the Bible. That is not because Lewis doesn't believe in the Bible. He believed the Bible was the word of God. But in writing apologetics for a modern setting, Lewis wanted to find common 
ground. He knew that if he based all of his arguments on Scripture, he would have a problem. Because if the people in his audience, whether they were atheists or theists or whatever, if they did not recognize the authority of Scripture, they would just dismiss everything he said. And so Lewis, throughout their Christianity, but especially in the first half, tries to find arguments outside of the Scriptures that point to the truth of God and the truth of Christ. You will find that when you read book one of mere Christianity, there's four books, book one, when you get to the end of that book, Lewis has only argued for theism. So if you are a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew, you will probably agree with him up to that point. Hinduism would be a little bit different because it's a little bit different than theism, but mostly if you're a religious person and believe in God, you're going to pretty much be with Lewis. Then and only then in book two does he move from theism, the belief that God exists, to Christianity, the belief that Jesus is the Son of God. So Lewis is taking us, he's, he's speaking to a post-Christian audience. And Lewis understood, as Christians sometimes don't understand, that you're not going to be very effective arguing that Jesus is the Son of God if the person you talk to doesn't even believe in God. So Lewis is building his argument slowly, and he is trying to find common ground. Now, <clears throat> Lewis's first work of apologetics was not mere Christianity. It was a book called The Problem of Pain, in which he tried to answer the question, why do good things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? To quote an old book. And Lewis was very successful in that book, The Problem of Pain, of taking difficult theological concepts and explaining them in layman terms that regular people could understand. And it's probably because of the success of The Problem of Pain that in 1940, during the Battle of Britain, that is when the Germans were bombing Britain from the air, when it was all chaotic, the Londoners didn't know if they were going to survive to the next day, the British BBC approached C.S. Lewis, who was also a professor at Oxford, approached him and asked him if he would give a series of broadcast talks over the radio explaining the basics of Christianity. Pretty amazing. I don't think our government would do that today. But they wanted Lewis to explain to the British public both the, you know, the, the, the high school dropout and the PhD to explain to everybody in simple but direct terms what is this Judeo-Christian tradition that we're fighting to, pr to, pr to protect from Nazism and ultimately communism? What, what is it that we hold in common? What are we fighting for? Right? People forget that, that we added in God we trust and uh, added one nation under God during the Cold War right? to try to show us that we're different than communism, that we believe in God and that that's the center of our morality and justice, or at least it's supposed to be. So Lewis... What we call Mere Christianity began as a series of radio broadcast talks over the BBC that people listened to during the dark days of World War II, when it seemed like democracy and freedom were going to be dead, like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, if you've read that book. Now, later on, about 10 years later, about 1950, 51, Lewis took those broadcast talks and polished them, edited them a little bit, and put them together into what we call mere Christianity. You'll notice when you read mere Christianity that there's a lot of martial language, in other words, having to do with war, the god Mars. He speaks of our world as enemy-occupied territory and Christ as the good king who has landed in secret and is rallying his troops to himself. And there's lots of wonderful imagery that reminds us of the setting in which Lewis first conceived of mere Christianity. All right. What about that title, mere Christianity? It doesn't mean merely Christianity. We're not simpering and whimpering back to the I'm sorry kind of apologetics. What Lewis means by mere Christianity is the basic doctrines of the Christian faith that all believers hold in common. Whether you're Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, whether you're Pentecostal, whether you're Baptist, whether you're Methodist, the basic doctrine of Christianity uh, what, we, what we see in the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Father Almighty. Lewis did have his own denominational beliefs. Lewis was an Anglican. 
He had his own understanding of the Lord's Supper and baptism, etc., etc. But Lewis, in mere Christianity, wants to be what we today would call non-denominational. He, is not, he has his own views, but he's not going to talk about what exactly happens at the Lord's Supper or whether we should have a believer's baptism or an infant baptism or what the end of the world is like or what the status of Mary is. Lewis focuses on the essential doctrines that all believing, confessing Christians share. Those would be the Trinity, the belief that God is one, but he exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Absolutely unique to Christianity. The incarnation, the belief that Jesus was not just an inspired man, but that he was fully God and fully man, 100% divine, 100% human. He also emphasizes the atonement. That is the belief that when Jesus died on the cross, he brought us back into a right relationship with God. Now, if you're a Baptist like me, you might be surprised when you read the section on the atonement that Lewis doesn't explain it the way I would or Billy Graham explaining how Jesus died and took the punishment for our sins. The reason he doesn't talk about that is not because he doesn't believe it, but Lewis says, I'm not here to give you an exact definition of the atonement. The point is, it works. <laughs> Jesus died, he shed his blood, he paid the ransom, and he brought us back into a right relationship with God. That's where Lewis leaves it. He has his own beliefs, but he's not going to push it more. He also believes, of course, in the bodily resurrection of Christ and the authority of Scripture and that Jesus will return. He doesn't get into, you know, the Left Behind series. It's just Christ will return. So it's not that Lewis doesn't have his own thoughts about things. Lewis doesn't even get into the fight about inerrancy or not, as, as we do in the Baptist world. It's, it's the authority of Scripture. It's the Word of God, and let's leave it at that. Again, Lewis is not trying to be wishy-washy. He says, we've got enough denominational books. We need a book to understand what we have in common. And one of the things I learned from Lewis and what he taught many people over the last 50 years is that I, as a Baptist who really believes in the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Atonement, and the Resurrection, has much more in common with a Catholic or an Orthodox or a, a Presbyterian who believes in those things than I do with a Baptist who just believes Jesus was a good man and we should follow his example. So Lewis tried to get to the essentials. This is what Christianity has always taught and has always believed and is in the creed. And let's leave it at that. In fact, in the introduction to mere Christianity, make sure you start by reading the introduction because it really is worth it, he says that his job as an apologist is to bring you into the hallway of the Christian faith. So, I'm coming in, I'm understanding the basic creed, I'm in the hallway, but once I'm there, I notice that there are all, a whole set of doors going to different places. And what are those doors? That's the Methodist door and the Anglican door and the Catholic door and the Orthodox door. And he leaves it to us to choose which door to go into. But Lewis wants to find common ground even between Christians. This is what we have in common. This is Orthodox Christianity. Another thing Lewis says in the introduction that I would encourage you to look at, Lewis tries to explain that over the last 200 years, the word Christian has become, unfortunately, almost a meaningless word. He makes an example of the word gentleman. Lewis was an English professor like I am, so he thinks about words all the time. And if you went back a couple hundred years ago, the word gentleman had a very specific meaning. A gentleman was somebody who had a certain pedigree or heritage, had a certain amount of land that he owned, etc., etc. That was a gentleman. The word gentleman was a noun. Now, it was hoped that someone who was a gentleman, literally speaking, would behave like a gentleman should, but that's a different idea. What happened, Lewis said, is we took the word gentleman, which was a noun and had a specific meaning, and we broadened the meaning. We turned it into an adjective. So now a gentleman is someone who acts like a gentleman should, opening doors for ladies or whatever. We've done the same thing with the word Christian. The word Christian used to have a very specific meaning. It is somebody who confesses these beliefs in the Nicene Creed, which all believing Christians share. But what happened over the last few hundred years? People said, oh, why don't we spiritualize the word? Certainly a Christian is someone who should behave like a Christian. And you know what that means? The word Christian is now a meaningless word. We already had the word good person, nice person. Why do we need to spoil the word Christian? And that is why I'm sure most of you have noticed 
that over the last maybe 30 or 40 years, if someone wants to tell you they're a Christian, but they want to mean, no, I'm really a Christian. I really believe these things. I'm not just trying to be a nice guy. I really believe that Jesus was the incarnate word of God. Then we are left to come up with our own adjectives. So when I was going to school in the 70s, we said, I'm a born-again Christian. People don't say that as much. It's a good word. It's Christian. It's biblical. Uh, we say, I'm an evangelical Christian sometimes. We say, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Uh, I, I'm a, a Christ-centered Christian. We, we've been forced to add adjectives to the word, and it's really annoying. You, you know where else we've seen that? It wasn't that long ago that if somebody wore a cross around their neck, it meant that they were a Christian who believed this. But now, when Madonna wears a cross, the cross is a meaningless symbol, right? That's why a lot of Christians today have adopted the fish. Most of you have seen that. It's usually on the back of a car that has just cut you off. Yeah, and, and uh, if you're gonna put the fish in your car, please drive like a Christian, okay? But the whole point of that is it's a way of somebody saying, no, I'm not just a Christian, I'm a real Christian. I really believe this stuff. I'm not just trying to be a nice guy, right? So when Lewis uses the word Christian in mere Christianity, He's using it in the objective sense, what Christianity has believed for 2,000 years. Finally, a few last things here. First of all, quick point on the organization. Book one is, again, merely an argument for theism. What proof can we find in the world, outside the Bible, what proof can we find in the world that God exists? Then, part two, how do we go from the belief in God to the belief in Christ as the Son of God? Then... In book three, he does something that you might not expect. Book three is about morality. It's actually about how to live the Christian life, because that is important. And he talks about virtue, how to live a virtuous life, what is virtue, what is not virtue. Then finally in book four, and only at the end, does he get into more specific theology. Helps us to understand concepts like the Trinity and the Incarnation and what it means on a deeper spiritual level to be a Christian. Finally. I really want to encourage you, as you read mere Christianity, to think of yourself as a wrestler. Don't read this book passively. Read it and argue with it, wrestle with it. Don't just you know, read it casually. Get a pen or a pencil or, if nothing else, a highlighter and mark things up. Write things in the margin. Argue with it. Lewis wants you to get into a debate. He's ready for that. Okay? And what I want you to understand when you read mere Christianity is that Lewis is trying to take Christian apologetics away from the surface and go down into the depths. Let me explain what I mean. A lot of Christians argue forever about uh, evolution and creation. Is it six literal days or six figurative days? Lewis doesn't get into that because there's a much bigger issue beneath that. The bigger issue is what is the nature of our universe? Do we live in a universe that is top down or do we live in a universe that is bottom up? Is the origin of everything ultimately spiritual or is the origin of everything ultimately physical? Lewis moves beyond surface arguments to get to what people today call world view issues. Now, if I was giving this lecture 20 or 30 years ago, I would have used the word paradigm. And some of you are familiar with the word paradigm shift, how science keeps changing it. But most people today, instead of paradigm, use the word worldview. It's actually spelled as one word because it's a German word, uh, Welt, Weltanschauung, all those compound uh, uh, German words, real long. And worldview means not just your belief or behavior, but what are the assumptions that underlie your belief and behavior? What is the nature of reality of God, man, and the universe? What is the deep set nature of things? And let me end by giving you two examples to get you thinking. First, this is kind of a funny one. Uh, I don't know if you'll remember a crazy guy named Ross Perot. All right? He ran for president many years ago. And he was a very interesting fellow. He ran as a third party. And he made this argument over and over again, I will be a great president because I'm a successful businessman. Now, what I hope you'll be able to do after you read Mere Christianity is take a statement like that. I'll be a great president because I'm a great businessman and try to figure out what assumptions underlie that statement. What underlies that statement is that the government should and would best be run as a business. Now, I'm not going to argue either way, but the point is that the real issue is, is that what the government should be? 
I would ask you to think about what a university should be. Is a university a business? Are you students, students or clients? Right? You've got to think about it. And finally, let me end with this. Uh, a little bit of wrestling I had to do in my own mind after reading Mere Christianity. If you're like me, you have probably made this argument before. When we read the Old Testament, whether we're Christian or Jewish or Muslim, and we see that Jews were forbidden pork, they were not allowed to eat pork. It's unclean. We try to figure that out. And if you're like me, I'll bet you have said this. Well, we now know that pork has a lot more germs and you know, uh, problems with it than lamb or meat, and so God forbade pork to keep the Jewish people safe from a lot of these diseases. Well, I've said that many times, and I'll bet many of you have said that. But I was reading for Christianity, and I was in a conversation, and I suddenly stopped myself and said, why did I say that? The Bible says nothing whatsoever about health. It says it's got to do with holiness, with clean and unclean. I can't tell you exactly what that means, but the Bible says nothing about health. Now, maybe that's why God did it. But my point that I want to end with is that the reason I, and probably most of you listening to this, immediately jumped to the conclusion that God must have forbade pork because it's got diseases is because our worldview says that health is the most important thing in the world. And we expect that if God tells us not to do something, he better have a rational reason for it. And to us, rational means scientific and health-based. Folks, Jesus didn't uh, fast for 40 days and 40 nights because he wanted to lose weight, okay? But in our modern day, we have a hard time thinking outside of our own little box. So please, while you're reading Mere Christianity, wrestle alongside C.S. Lewis. Ask yourself, what are the assumptions that you base your life and your beliefs on? Happy reading.